Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, the atheists, the agnostics, the Hindus, the Buddhists, and yes, even you Rastafarians who are watching from all over the world. Uh, I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the author of a lot of books, a lot of books, including uh, Jesus Interrupted, Misquoting Jesus, God's Problem, which is uh, on the problem of evil, and many others. Uh, Dr. Ehrman, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. By the way, for the for the the benefit of all people everywhere, I usually hear Bart Ehrman, but I've also heard Bart Ehrman. So is there a definitive way of saying that? Uh, my family says Ehrman. It originally was Ehrman. It was a, uh, it was Alf Deutsch, but uh, we say Ehrman. We've anglicized it. Ehrman? Yeah, Ehrman, yeah. Okay, okay. We'll go with that. <laughs> and I'll probably get it wrong anyway. All right, uh, uh, Dr. Ehrman, well, you have a debate coming up next month with Dr. Mike Lacona on the resurrection of Jesus. I want to take everyone to that page here in a second, just because, just so they can know uh, how to register for that debate. And I've talked to the apostate prophet who whose program you've been on. And uh, I think we're gonna go live afterwards so that everyone can have a discussion um, after watching the debate uh, on our channels. And so our, our viewers, the idea would be our viewers can watch the debate and then they can meet up with us uh, and have a discussion afterwards. So that should be a, that should be a fun day. Uh, but before we jump into that, uh, why don't you give everyone a little introduction into uh, where you started and how you got to where you are now? Ah, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, this will only take 45 minutes. You don't mind, do I? <laughs> <laughs> we're good, we're good. So, so uh, the, the brief thing is, I, I was raised in a Christian household. I was raised Episcopalian. Uh, when I was in high school, I had a born-again experience when I was 15 and became uh, an evangelical Christian um, and uh, then became a very conservative evangelical. And after high school, I went to Moody Bible Institute, which is a fundamentalist Bible college and loved it, absolutely loved it, um, thrived on it. After that, I went to Wheaton College to finish my degree, uh, which is a liberal arts, Christian liberal arts college, of course, and I loved that too. I became an, uh, really interested in the Greek language. I took Greek in Wheaton, and I went to Princeton Theological Seminary because I wanted to study Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Um, and my, my mentor was Bruce Metzger, who was the, the greatest textual scholar in the country and arguably in the world. And so I wanted to study with him. While I was at Princeton, I started studying the Bible more intensely, reading the New Testament in Greek and the Old Testament in Hebrew. And I started recognizing that my view of the inerrancy of the Bible was problematic. I started seeing that there are, in fact, uh, problems in the Bible, contradictions and mistakes of various kinds. I eventually left my fundamentalist faith and became i remained an evangelical for a while and then uh, after a while i just I, I had trouble remaining evangelical i i was a liberal christian maybe for 13 or 15 years after that uh but maybe about i don't know 25 years or so ago 30 years ago i decided i just didn't believe at all uh, not because of my biblical scholarship but because i was wrestling with this problem you mentioned earlier the problem of evil and how you can explain this world if there's a god who's in control of it. And, you know, I, I knew all the answers, I, you know, the people said, but I, I eventually became an agnostic. Um, and so now I, that's what I am. I'm uh, agnostic, atheist, um, biblical scholar, which makes me a rather rare creature. <laughs> not too many of us around, uh, but I'm a scholar of the historical Jesus in the New Testament, but I'm, I'm not a believer myself. Mm -hmm. And you have coming up with Mike Lacona, on March 9th, in fact, let me go ahead and pull this up here. You have a debate next month on April 9th, 2022 with Mike Lacona. Now I'm looking at the time here and it's 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Are you guys actually having a seven hour debate? We are. <laughs> so <it'll, laughs> so there, there is a lunch break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And so, but I mean, uh, yeah, we, uh, you know, the thing is, I, I've done a lot of debates, I've, uh, and Mike has too, and the debates are always very frustrating because, you know, you get up and do, thir you do your 20 minute spiel, then he does his 20 minute spiel, then you have a 10 minute response, he has a 10, they take quite, and it's like, you don't have time to develop any ideas. It's just like, bam, bam, bam. And we thought, you know, wouldn't it be interesting where you can actually develop your argument and so not in a boring way, like not in a way like, oh, my God, I'm going to. It's like, but it's like it's, there's so much involved mm -hmm. in this. And so we'll be doing different things, talking about different things and and trying to show what what our positions are. Mike is a Mike is also a New Testament scholar, a Ph.D. in New Testament, who's written a large book on the resurrection. And uh, we we completely we, we respect each other and we're friends and we completely disagree on this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I'm expecting to be a lively. It'll be seven hours, but it's going to be pretty lively, I think. All right. Well, this. Uh, so the the one of the benefits of this will be that you guys get to go into a lot more detail than we're familiar with. And uh, I know this from. I do. Know, I do know. Understand that from experience, where someone raises an objection or something, and you're thinking, Ah, gosh, it would take ten minutes to. I mean, even begin yeah. to address that. And I don't have ten minutes. I, you know, I don't even. I can't even spend thirty seconds on it. Well, you know, and you, the, the, you know, the other guy will give this thirty-minute speech, and then you're supposed to stand up and give like a ten-minute rebuttal yeah. on the spot. Yeah, yeah. It's like, boom, 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 boom. It's like, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's not a good. It's normally it's not a good venue, even though I you know, we do it all the time. It's like, but so this will be a chance for us to and be, to cover more stuff. It isn't just kind of hammering the same point over mm -hmm. for seven hours. <laughs> that yeah. would be interesting. No, it's going to be like covering all sorts of different areas that are relevant to mm -hmm. the to the issue. All right, so everyone, you can see here the link is in the description box to click on uh, to click on. Uh, this site and you can see it's thirty nine ninety five to register as of right now um, They do have to pay the bills for setting up events like this and again I believe that the apostate prophet and I will go live that evening to discuss our thoughts on it uh, I'm a Christian AP is an atheist so uh, we'll give our perspective on that and uh, I was looking at this site here just wanted to cover one thing so you have uh, you have the debate opponents Dr. Bart Ehrman uh, and Mike Lacona, and then you guys give statements on your perspective, but down towards the bottom, I think I saw a statement that was from both of you. And down at the bottom here, it says, whether you are a believer, fundamentalist, evangelical, moderate, liberal, or a non-believer, Jesus is the most significant individual in the history of our civilization coming to understand who Jesus actually was and what he actually did and did not do is one of the most important intellectual endeavors anyone in our society can embark upon. But then it's it's got Dr. Bart Ehrman and Dr. Mike Lacona underneath it. So is that is that both of your perspective? Well, certainly my perspective. I mean, you know, I'm not a believer, but I mean, who could deny that Jesus is the most important figure in the history of civilization? I mean, there are two billion people, who, over two billion people who worship him. Who, who else can you say that about a human being? And so, uh, no, it's, no, I mean, Jesus is incredibly important, and I'm, I'm completely committed to understanding who the historical Jesus was and uh, about his life and and what his teachings were and so i'm completely committed to that uh because of the supreme importance of it um yeah yeah i no, i agree. i don't think i wrote that statement but i would completely agree with it and just in the name of full disclosure uh i've known mike for over 20 years so I will be rooting for Mike during this debate, and so uh, we'll uh, we'll all we'll all watch it, and I'm sure we'll all have a, an awesome time. All right, so uh, we have a pretty good mixture of Christian viewers, uh, atheist viewers, and Muslim viewers right now, and so wanted to touch on just a couple issues that are relevant to uh, everyone. But you've interacted in the past, and sometimes. Uh, Sometimes you seem a little ticked off, it seems, uh, with the Jesus mythers. Um, so the idea that Jesus did not actually exist. And I, I, I was an atheist until I was 20 years old, but that was back in the 90s. And I just remember, it never crossed my mind that Jesus didn't exist or we were talking about some sort of mythical figure. So uh, what's your perspective on the idea that Jesus didn't exist? Well, I, I know. I mean, I've got to figure out a better way to respond to this because I really do get ticked off. <laughs> my my knee starts jerking all over the place. I, uh, 
you know, I, it's a question of can, I mean, it's a question of what history is. If what can you establish as historical fact and what counts as historical evidence? And the mythicists who want to deny that Jesus exists, you know, they might as well deny anything mm -hmm. and they will deny anything. And once you start going down that road, does evidence matter or not? Or can you just make stuff up and convince people? Well, yes, you can and do. And so I just think, um, you know, but the mythicists always get angry at me because I point out that there's nobody, you know, I mean, there, there's no university or college professor in the country who's an expert in this. And there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of, you know, and they're not just all fundamentalist Christians. I mean, they're people like me and uh, who just think, no, I mean, it's, are you kidding me? And so, uh, yeah, but they get upset when I say that, and my knee does start jerking. I, I do admit, um, but if you know, we, Jesus is by far the best documented person from first century Israel. There's nobody even close. He's far better documented than Josephus. Why not deny Josephus existed? He's better doc. I mean, so yeah. Sorry. No, you're, no, you're <laughs> good. I wrote a book about it. I wrote a book how, uh, about did Jesus exist and. You know, a lot of a lot of very conservative evangelicals get very upset with me, but it's nothing like the mythicists. Man, they're really after me. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, uh, we can believe things and believe them and say, like, you know, I'm 60 percent sure of this. So I believe it or a 70 percent sure, 80 percent sure or something like that. Um, based on your studies, when you say that you believe that Jesus exists, uh, existed, uh, are you talking like 60% sure, 80% sure, 90% sure? Like if you if you were to put a percentage well, on it. You know, I never I never do percentages with history because I just think that it's kind of a hopeless case. You know, people, especially, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe, there's something about evangelical Christians that I debate that just love statistics. Mm, like, oh. you know, Dan Wallace goes around saying things like, you know, we know about 99% of the New Testament is accurate. I go, where do you get this 99% from? What kind of statistical analysis is this exactly? And, you know, or Richard Carrier talks about the percentages that Jesus didn't exist. And he proves it statistically. Yes, come on. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't put percentages. I I do I do think think things are virtually certain things are highly probable things are probable things are probable. I do do it kind of like and it for me it's for me it's between virtually certain and certain that Jesus existed mm -hmm. <laughs> what what he said and did is problematic but it's what yeah. do you I mean, it's, not, it's not as probable Jesus existed as you know Donald Trump existed mm -hmm. I mean you know it's mm -hmm. not that probable but I mean how, how much evidence do you need for somebody in the past existing? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so what what do you think is fueling? Uh, what do you think is fueling this uh, recent rise over the past, I guess, fifteen to twenty years? Because again, I, it never occurred to me uh, back in the nineties, yeah. but now it's, all of a sudden I hear it. It's, it's been around for a long time. Um, this was first became an issue in the, during the French Revolution in the seven, you know, so I mean, we're talking about the 18th century. So it's not that this has been invented. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, there have always been people who, and what's behind it is a, uh, an atheist attempt to show that Christianity is completely bogus. Mm -hmm. And so how bogus is it? The person they worship never even existed. So the thing is, you know, I, I sympathize with the atheist cause in some ways. I mean, because I, you know, I'm an agnostic or an atheist too, but I think these people are just shooting themselves in the in the foot because if you want to if you want to challenge Christianity, you shouldn't do it with an argument that other people laugh at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Good and advice. So good think, advice. I, yeah. So I think I think there are other things to say, but to, I just think it's I just think it's look. I'm, no, I won't go into the evidence. It's just like you know how much. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, so a, a sort of sort of related question. Um, it's also very popular, mainly online. I don't hear two. I don't hear scholars talking about it. But there's the claim that beliefs about Jesus arose from various Egyptian pagan myths and so on. The, so they look at the pagan parallels and they'll say belief in the resurrection arose from something with yeah. Osiris or something like that. Uh, what, what's your perspective on on those so parallels? Well, I, Is that where belief that arose? Yeah, I mean, I cover that in my book, Did Jesus Exist? Because this is an argument that the mythicists themselves also use. Um, my view is that there, there are a lot of stories about Jesus that do closely parallel uh, stories that you get about other sons of God in the ancient world that were in circulation before Christianity. 
And so you have people who are born miraculously when when a divine being makes a, a woman pregnant and uh, people who can do miracles and can heal the sick and cast out demons and raise the dead and people who ascend to heaven when they die. There there are these stories that were around well before Christianity. And I'm, I imagine that probably Christians who were grown up in that environment, when they tell stories about Jesus, of course, they're affected by the way stories like this are told. I think that's absolutely right. I think, though, that... Um, it goes way too far to say that the stories, for example, of Jesus' resurrection were modeled on these Egyptian stories. I mean, what are these people even thinking? The people who started talking about Jesus' resurrection were rural Galilean Jews who had never, the, the only trip these disciples had ever made in their life was to Jerusalem. They went 100 miles. They didn't know anything about Egyptian culture. What, how could that possibly have influenced them is, and so the, historically, it's just completely bogus. So, uh, so they would. Uh, so the, the the belief of the uh, disciples must have arisen from their own uh, local context somehow. Yeah. No. They. They. Yes. Okay. Uh, the, I mean, within Judaism, there's a belief that there would be a resurrection of the dead at the end of time, and what the disciples said is that Jesus started it. He so I mean Paul a little bit later said that Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, meaning that there's going to everybody's going to be raised from the dead and Jesus is the first for it to happen. So this is an internal Jewish development. It's got nothing to do with Osiris mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> in, in Egypt. All right, thank you for that. And a quick comment right here, just because we're we're getting asked here. Uh, uh, Hader asked, "Is this a debate or just a discussion?" Uh, yeah, this is not a debate, uh, Hader. This is uh, the debate will be next month. I'm not debating. This is an interview. I'm here to ask uh, Dr. Ehrman his perspective on various issues. So uh, he's an atheist. I'm a Christian. We obviously have disagreements, but uh, yeah, we are we are not debating right now. Just asking. Was he, was he asking whether the thing with Michael Cohen is going to be a debate or discussion, though? Oh, that's that's. I think. I think people are asking, are, are we debating? Because yeah, we're, you and I are not yeah. debating now, although we might. Yeah. But but some people have asked me whether because we first Mike and I start, started out thinking maybe we should just make this a discussion. You know, mm. we each kind of presenter. But then it's kind of evolved into yeah, it's going to be a debate. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's gonna, it's going to be. I, it's not going to be good at the jugular kind of debate. Well, it might be. I don't know. Yeah. But I mean, it's uh, yeah. Yeah. All right now. Um, so we talked about the uh, Jesus mythers. Um, so on the issue of the historical Jesus, so a Christian would generally go to the Bible, look at the Gospels and say, here's where I get my beliefs uh, about Jesus. Um, as someone who doesn't believe in the divine inspiration of the text, uh, you've got, you know, the, the books of the New Testament which were originally circulating by themselves. And then you have sources outside the New Testament. And then you have, you know, second century sources and so on. Um, I'm not sure there can be any sort of official ranking now, but as someone, if you're talking to someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, but is trying to do it do what you said in the in the statement on the on the site that hey we should learn about jesus uh what would be like your your go-to sources to learn about jesus uh well the only only useful sources are the four gospels i mean we have we have some gospels from later uh gospel of thomas gospel of peter and they might give us a scrap or two but basically nothing and the the there are no roman sources that mention jesus in the entire first cent no greek or roman sources outside of the christian sources and josephus josephus mentions a couple of things but he doesn't give us anything that's not already in the gospels and so um for anybody doing the historical jesus there's no option you you, you go with the gospels but the historian doesn't treat them as inspired sources in the sense that every word they say is historically accurate um, because there's good reasons for knowing that in fact they're not always accurate as mike lacona himself says by the way <laughs> so if you take if you take that approach not taking them as inspired uh and you're yeah. looking at them as uh basically historical documents um yeah. and as an atheist you I'm, I'm assuming you wouldn't believe in uh that jesus actually performed miracles and so on so what would you say, based on the documents that we have available to us, uh, what would you say that we can know about Jesus? Uh, I think we know a lot about him, about a lot about what he said and did. Um, 
And, um, you know, because when, when whoever wrote the Gospel of Matthew did not think he was writing the Bible. <laughs> he was writing an account of Jesus' life and his teachings, his, his activities, and his death and resurrection. So the historian uses that just like the historian would use a source for Napoleon or Julius Caesar. I mean, it's a, somebody's favorably inclined. Plutarch writing a, bibli a biography is, in, is inclined to, you know, appreciate this person he's writing about usually. And, and so you use it with that in mind. Um, so I've written a lot over the years uh, about what we can say about what Jesus said and did. My first book for a general audience was just on that question. You know, how does a historian approach these sources? And the, the view that's been around, um, I'll tell you, my views, of Je my views of Jesus actually today are not different from my views when I was a Christian scholar. Um, not when I was a fundamentalist or a conservative evangelical, but when I, when I started teaching at Chapel Hill, I was a Christian, went to church every week, taught adult education, but I, I did not think that Jesus went around calling himself God. Um, I thought that Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. Um, somebody who predicted that, who, someone who believed that this world is controlled by forces of evil. That's why there's so much, so many awful things happening that we often can't explain, is because there are evil powers in control of this world. And Jesus, as a Jewish person at the time, really thought that. And he also thought that God was ready to intervene to change the entire created order because he was, he was going to get rid of these forces of evil. He was going to destroy everything opposed to him, including everybody opposed to him, and bring in a good kingdom here on earth that would be ruled by, by God through his, through his Messiah. And Jesus was expecting this to happen, and he thought it would happen in his own generation. Uh, that, and, and so that was the heart of his message. As, as, as he says throughout the entire Synoptic Gospels, that's what he preaches. Jesus in the early sources, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, does not go around saying, believe in my death and resurrection for your salvation, which became the Christian message. Jesus says, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. You need to repent and prepare for this kingdom that's coming. And he meant kingdom. <laughs> he didn't mean heaven. He meant like a kingdom of God here, uh, as other Jews meant. And so I think Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet expecting the end to come soon. Is there anything like if you were to make like a, a little bullet list of uh, things that you would say as a historian that uh, who, who doesn't believe in divine inspiration, uh, if there were like a bullet list of other things that you agreed uh, or, or that you could know about Jesus? Anything else? So apocalypse, apocalypse. Well, lots of lots of things. I mean, I think you know we can verify. I think there there are criteria that historians use for anything. If you, I mean, if you want to know about the life of Abraham Lincoln, and you've got a bunch of sources, you've got to figure out how to use the sources. And so that's so we use the same criteria for doing the historical Jesus. And when you apply those, you can. There are all sorts of things that Jesus said that he, he probably said. There are some things that you think, yeah, he probably didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Same with Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. And there are things that he did. I mean, he, you know, he was certainly baptized by John the Baptist, in my judgment. He, um, he, had, he had a preaching ministry when he was preaching the coming kingdom. He had 12 disciples around him. Um, he uh, uh, he, he uh, spent most of his time up in Galilee. He was uh, preaching to the people who had listened to him. He had 12 disciples. He, he went to Jerusalem the end of his life. He, he, uh, he went during a Passover feast, and he got on the wrong side of the law and uh, was crucified by his opponent. I mean, there's a whole list of things you can say that I think are, are highly probable. It's coming from the life of Jesus. And there are a lot of things in the Gospels that you say, yeah, probably not. And you, uh, I saw in your uh, discussion with the apostate prophet, you said that you think Jesus believed he was the Messiah? Yes, but he, not in the sense that Christians say that. Mm. Christian, but when Christians say Jesus is the Messiah, what they typically mean is that Jesus was the one sent by God to die for the sins of the world and to be raised from the dead. There was no Jew in the days of Jesus who thought that's what the Messiah was going to be. There, there were no Jews who thought that. Um, the Messiah was going to, they had different expectations of the Messiah. So depending which Jewish sources you're reading, um, but the, the most common view is that the Messiah was going to be a descendant of David, who, like David, would be a political figure, a warrior, who drove out the enemy and became the king over a sovereign state of Israel. 
That's the most common view. Other, other Jews thought that the Messiah would be a cosmic figure who destroyed the forces of evil, God's enemies, and set up a kingdom here on earth, kind of a cosmic judge, uh, one like a son of man, as in the book of Daniel. There are other Jews, the, the Jews that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls thought there were going to be two messiahs. <laughs> one apparently was going to be like a, a political figure who would be subservient to the, the major messiah, who was a priest, who would interpret God's laws and would rule the people of God with a fist of iron. And so all, there are various views, but all of these views had in common the idea that the Messiah would be a great figure of, of grandeur and power who would overwhelm the enemy and set up and, and rule God's people. Christians, of course, have never said that because Jesus didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Jesus was crucified. Uh, and then they believed he got raised from the dead. And so Christians came up with this idea that the Messiah is not supposed to be any of those things. The Messiah is supposed to be somebody who dies and is raised. And then they turned to their Bible and they found passages that seemed to say that about there's going to be some righteous person who suffers and then God vindicates, like Isaiah 53 or Psalm 22. And there's all these verses that most of your readers, your listeners will know about. Um, and they claim that's talking about the Messiah. And that's, so that's where the idea of a suffering Messiah came from. Those, those passages, by the way, never talk about the Messiah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Read Isaiah 53 and look for the word Messiah sometime. <laughs> um, not there. On, the, on, on, a, on a, another issue about the historical Jesus, I've seen, I've seen atheists who would say, hey, I don't believe Jesus actually performed miracles, but I believe he was known as a miracle worker. So yeah. is your perspective that he was... He was that's how he was known, like similar to way, like, you know, I would think of Benny Hinn. I don't think he's actually performing miracles, but I think he's known yeah. like that. Or is that a, would you say that's a later Christian invention? I'm not sure whether it was going on during his lifetime or not. I wouldn't be surprised if it was going on during his lifetime. I wouldn't be surprised if it happened afterwards. Um, you know, the problem today is that when we think about miracles, we have such a different conception of it from people in the ancient world. Because for us, we, we know about things like natural law. I mean, um, you know, whether you're a Newtonian or uh, whether you follow Einstein, you, you've got this view of gravity that it always holds. <laughs> mm. it, it, it does not get violated. It's law. And in the ancient world, they didn't they didn't think about it that way. It's like, you know, the, the there wasn't the ancient world actually didn't have a realm of the supernatural. This seems weird to us. Because we have, you know, we got the natural thing, we got the supernatural thing, and if there's a miracle, it's the supernatural thing. But the ancient world, they didn't have this division. They didn't even have words for natural and supernatural in the same way. Whatever happens is what the gods want to happen. So if you got a miracle worker, some guy's like, you know, God's making it happen. Well, you know, God makes the sun rise and makes, you know, allow this person to heal the sick. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it's not... It's not categorically different the way it is for us. Mm -hmm. So I have no trouble with believing that people in Jesus' day, they certainly believed that other people were doing miracles, and they probably thought Jesus, I guess, maybe thought Jesus was. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue, since you've got the debate coming up next month on the resurrection, a uh, couple issues related to the resurrection. So uh, in order to rise from the dead, Jesus would need to be dead. So are you and Mike going to agree on that? Um, well, I hope Mike hasn't changed his mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jesus is dead. Okay. <laughs> of course he was dead, yes. <laughs> we will agree, I, you know, unless he thinks he wasn't dead. <laughs> so no disputing on death by crucifixion? No. So the dispute will be whether he was alive again later, obviously, right? Uh, well, the dispute, so... I don't think Mike's going to argue that it was a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. um, so he's going to be arguing that it was a resurrection. So there's a difference between a near-death experience or you know, what used to be more commonly called a resuscitation. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between a resuscitation and a resurrection. A resurrection means the person doesn't die again. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of Jesus is, is not that he was like, brought back from the dead to live for another 20 years and then die. The way, say, you know, Lazarus, for example, or Jairus's daughter, they would have died again. So the idea of a resurrection is is it's kind of the whole package. He was dead, he was brought back to life, and made immortal. Um, so, 
since Jesus was dead, uh, it, it seems like the early Christians were were convinced that he had risen from the dead. And one of the main issues here is that his disciples had some sort of experiences which they in, interpreted as uh, seeing him post-mortem. So uh, what is your perspective on that? Is, is that later myth or uh, were they hallucinating or? Well, I think they certainly, I think some of them, I don't know. We don't have good, look, we don't have good records for any of this, unfortunately, because none, none of the people uh, the disciples, none of the disciples who allegedly saw something have left us any records. And so we don't have them saying it. Um, the closest thing we have is Paul, who probably converted three years later. It's usually what people uh, suggest based on doing Pauline chronology is a little bit complicated, but Paul does date something, you know, three years later I did this, 12 years, you know, that kind of thing. And when you add it all together, it looks like if Jesus died, say, in the year 30, then it looks like Paul converted in the year 33. And Paul, Paul, I think, certainly had a vision of Jesus. He, he, he thought, by vision, I don't, mean any, I don't mean it's a hallucination. I mean he saw something. Mm -hmm. And either it was a hallucination, in other words, the thing wasn't there, or it really was Jesus. But either way, he saw something. And, I, and some of the earlier disciples did, too. That's why they believed in the resurrection. They absolutely didn't believe because of an empty tomb. It was, the New Testament is clear on this. They, they believed because they had they saw Jesus. And I think they absolutely, some of them absolutely saw, I doubt if all 12, 11 did, but I, but I, my guess is that a couple of them did, maybe Peter, maybe Mary Magdalene. They're the ones who were first credited with seeing Jesus. And so I think they had some kind of visionary experience. And Christians would say, well, they saw Jesus, he appeared. And non-Christians would say, well, they had hallucinations. But either way, I think they saw something mm -hmm. that convinced them um, that Jesus was raised, yes. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of the debate's going to come down to whether we should take w whatever those experiences were seriously. Um, oh, uh, I take them. I take them deadly seriously. Oh, okay. They absolutely. I think they saw something. Okay. Absolutely. So they. Okay, so they saw something, and the question is, did they see the risen Jesus? That would that would be the that would be the that would be the dispute, or or more, or more likely. Can we know that what they saw was the risen Jesus? Would that be, would that be yeah. more accurate? I think they believe. I think I, I absolutely think they believe they saw the risen Jesus. That that doesn't mean they saw the risen Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know all sorts of people who've seen the Blessed Virgin Mary lately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't think they did, but they're convinced they did. All right. Um, now you, we we so you mentioned Paul. Uh, what about what about James? So. I mean, if you just go with the, the Gospels, it doesn't look like James uh, had much confidence in his brother during that time, but later becomes an apostle. Yeah. So what, yeah. what, what's your perspective there? I don't think we know. Mm -hmm. um, he, I, think he certainly, I think he certainly came to believe Jesus was raised from the dead. Um, and so that is, it's quite remarkable, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, that Jesus' own brother believed he got raised from the dead. That. I mean, just think about that for a second. Think about your you know, your own siblings for a while. Mm -hmm. Wow, really? <laughs> My siblings don't think I'm the son of God. I got to tell you that. And so, like, how? So something remarkable must have happened. It doesn't mean that necessarily he had a personal experience. Uh, Paul says he did, um, and so um, and Paul knew him, uh, and so. Uh, which, by the way, throws a bit of a monkey wrench in the mythicist argument that Jesus didn't exist. That's true. <laughs> Paul, Paul knows his brother. Yeah. You know, if Jesus didn't exist, you would think his brother would know about it. <laughs> it's like, huh, really? Yeah. So, uh, but I think so. I think James either either people like Peter convinced him that they saw him, or he himself had an experience. Mm -hmm. I think those are the two options. Mm -hmm. And and too bad the mythers weren't there to. Uh... <laughs> to tell James that his brother didn't exist. Uh, now, uh, on, to, on to some other issues uh, on, the, on the borderline of Islam and Christianity. Uh, we've got Paul, whom you've talked about, and you've got Muhammad, whom you've talked about. Neither one of these guys apparently knew Jesus when uh, he had his earthly ministry. Both of them claim to have received revelations and both of them went around talking a lot about uh jesus so who who would you go with if you had to pick someone talking about jesus between paul and muhammad yeah as a source 
I mean, you know, Muhammad is 500 years later. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, I don't think anybody claims Muhammad knew Jesus. Yeah. Nobody claims Paul knew Jesus. I mean, at least they shouldn't claim that. I mean, Paul didn't. I uh, Paul Paul is not from Israel. In the book of Acts, Paul Paul is said to have studied with Gamaliel in Israel, but I don't believe that's true. Uh, the book of Acts says he's from Tarsus. I doubt if that's true, too. And he says he's a Roman citizen. I doubt if that's true. I mean, there are reasons for doubting all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but he doesn't say so himself. He says none of that. He doesn't say that. I mean, he says nothing about being educated in Jerusalem. And he doesn't give any good evidence of even knowing Hebrew uh, or Aramaic. And so I think that he, he, he was Greek. He grew up, who knows where, out in the diaspora someplace. And he absolutely didn't know didn't know Jesus. Do, but you you mentioned that he he knew his brother. So do you think he interacted with the with the apostles? Well, he says he did, uh, but he doesn't say what they talked about. You know, he so after he converted, it says that he went off to Arabia. He says he went off to Arabia for three years. This is in Galatians chapter one, and. You know, I used to, I guess I used to think that that many went off into the desert and meditated for three years and had visions and things. So I don't think that's really what he means. Arabia was included the Nabataean kingdom where like um, Petra is. And so I think he probably means that he went to the Nabataean kingdom and he might have started his missionary work there. Um, but after three years, he went to Jerusalem and he says that he met with Cephas and James. Um, and but he insists he didn't meet with any of the other apostles. And I'm not quite sure why, why he didn't or why, he, but he didn't. Uh, and he doesn't say what they talked about, except that they spent, um, he spent two weeks there. So, of course, our normal assumption is that you'd want to kind of, you know, crib up on what Jesus said and did. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what I would have done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, he seems to suggest instead that what he was doing was telling them that he's got this mission to the Gentiles and he's trying to convince them that these Gentiles do not have to become Jewish to follow the Jewish Messiah. That's certainly the issue when he goes back 14 years later. He spends his time trying to convince them that the Gentiles do not have to keep the law. Um, and so given the fact that he says hardly anything at all about the historical Jesus in his writings, it's quite remarkable how little Paul tells us about Jesus' life. He says a lot about his death and his resurrection and what he's doing now. But in terms of what he, Jesus did between the time he was born and the time he, he, he died, I, I, tell my, I have my students, I give them an assignment sometimes. I tell them, list everything Paul says about Jesus' life, everything he said, everything he did between birth and death. They don't need a three by five card. It's amazing how little. So if he knew more, he doesn't say much more. So I don't know what he, I don't know what he heard from these two. Mm -hmm. Um. Also on a related issue, since the main, I mean, it's interesting. So uh, the disagreement between atheists and Christians wouldn't be about Jesus' death. It would be about whether uh, a miracle occurred and he, 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 he was resurrected. Whereas Muslims have no problem with the resurrection. They have a problem with the idea that Jesus died. And so there are, there are a couple of issues here. Um, but w one of the issues is, uh, as you know, Muslims uh, generally believe that the uh, text of the New Testament must have began uh, in some stage where it was a book brought by Jesus. And so it's this bro book brought by Jesus, and then it later on gets corrupted into eventually uh, the four Gospels we have now. Um, but Muslims here, Muslims here, well, Bart Ehrman talks about all these textual variants, uh, hundreds of thousands of textual variants in the gospels and they think and just because i talk to them all the time but they, they really think that there are all these different versions of the gospels that say all these kinds of different things uh yeah. with 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 different doctrines and that somewhere in there there's there's uh there's material that agrees with them um yeah. on their per, on what the quran says and then different gospels uh elsewhere and is that where you, is that what you would get from textual criticism no, I tell you, it's not just Muslims, of course. The conservative evangelicals accuse me of saying or say that I say things I just don't say. I just don't know if people can't read anymore or what. 
But you know, when I talk about all these differences in the manuscripts, it's not a debated point. There are hundreds of thousands of differences. But I also say that most of them are completely immaterial and insignificant. Most of them are misspelled words. It's like there are not variants in the New Testament that say Jesus didn't die, you know, or that Jesus made clay pigeons, or that you know somebody else got crucified instead of Jesus. No, that's not what I'm talking about. And so. Uh, you know, they just they, they read into what I say, what I don't say, and it's very frustrating. Um, so the the variant accounts of Jesus that you get in the Quran, um, almost all of them are found in later Christian legends before they're in the Quran. For example, Jesus is a boy making clay pigeons or clay birds mm-hmm. or or the them crucifying the wrong guy thinking it's Jesus. These are, we have gospel, or Christian gospels that have these views that are obviously not in the New Testament. And so the Quran is picking that up from early Christian apocryphal texts, all that stuff from early Christian apocryphal texts, not, not from variants in the New Testament. And Jesus did not give his disciples a gospel. <laughs> and it's like, where is that coming from? <laughs> Jesus wasn't literate to begin with. I mean, he, he might, he probably could read, but nothing suggests he could write. And nothing says he wrote a gospel. So, yeah. So, um, uh, on, on the issue of sources, because earlier I asked where you would go as a historian, uh, you said the best source would be the uh, New Testament Gospels. So you're saying that these these later sources, you know, Arabic or Syriac infancy gospel and so on, where Muslims, uh, where Muhammad was apparently getting information, these wouldn't be on your list of go to places to learn about Jesus. My view is that a historian has to look at every possible source and evaluate it critically. So you don't reject anything out of hand. You, you, you analyze it because you're desperate for any information you can get. You apply the same criteria to all the sources. When you apply the criteria uh, that historians use to something like the infancy gospel of Thomas, which is one of my favorite non-canonical gospels, it's about Jesus as a boy between the ages of five and 12. It's fantastic. I love it, but in terms of its historical value, no, there's nothing there. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's the four Gospels, yeah. All right, so uh, j- just to give uh, one more thing on the issue of textual criticism and uh, basically misunderstandings about what you're claiming, uh, I'll just go ahead and give a quick um, specific example here. So I'll go to the Gospel of Mark, and I've just pulled up, For instance, uh, Jesus predicting his death when he goes up to Jerusalem. So 831, he says, and he be, uh, it says, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise from the dead and then 930 to 31. And from there, they went out and began going through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know about it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them the son of man is to be handed over to men and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. And then, of course, uh, Mark 10, 32 to 34. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking on ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him saying, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise from the dead. So on the issue of Uh, textual criticism. It seems like Muslims need textual criticism to lead them to some Jesus who's not predicting his death. Whereas it seems, it seems very easy to say, I don't believe Jesus predicted his death. I believe that people wrote that back into the accounts after they knew that he was, that he had died. But what I'm saying is, is textual criticism getting to some edition of the gospel of Mark where Jesus isn't predicting this, this sort of thing? Okay, so it's important. I'm not sure that all all your listeners will uh, understand exactly what textual criticism is because people use it in ways that are not the way scholars tend to use it. When when a scholar uses the term textual criticism, what they're talking about is if you've got if you've got a, a you've got a writing, it doesn't matter whether it's Shakespeare or Plato or the New Testament or anything. Textual criticism tries to find out what the author originally wrote. That's what the that's what textual critic. It's not 
analyzing the text, interpreting the text, trying to figure out if it's historical or not. It's just figuring out what did the author write. Whether he wrote something that was correct or not, it's a different issue. Mm -hmm. And so for the example I often use is because, you know, Muslims will say that the Quran is absolutely accurate because there, none of the copies are different from one another. And that strikes me as a crazy claim. You know, we have millions of copies of Hitler's Mein Kampf, and we know what he wrote. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with whether it's accurate or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just means we know what he wrote. Textual criticism tries to figure out what an, a scholar wrote, I mean, what a, a, an author wrote. Mark wrote those passages. And so there, 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 is not a, there was not an earlier New Testament that was lacking those passages. Those passages were in whatever Mark wrote, absolutely. That doesn't mean that Jesus said it, but it does mean that it's what Mark wrote. So there are, two, there are different kinds of analysis. One is figuring out what an author wrote, and other is figuring out if what he wrote is accurate or not. Two mm -hmm. diff they're different things. They're not the same thing. So I, I know you know that, but, but some listeners get it confused. Uh, and it's important to understand that it, it's quite different. So it, it, Muslims need some sort of, it, I mean, it's kind of a reverse picture where they need an early Jesus who wasn't crucified and then somehow this evolved into the story of him dying by crucifixion. And uh, everyone else pretty much believes that you have Jesus dying by crucifixion. And then later you end up with some stories about him not dying by crucifixion or, or this ending up or this being an, an illusion or something like that. So would you say that as far as the, the evidence we actually have, there's you don't have this early evidence of a, of a Jesus who no, didn't die? No, no, no. Look, the only the only um, the only evidence. So early early Christians had different views about Jesus crucifixion. Um, the only one, the only evidence we have of somebody not believing in his crucifixion is a second century gospel that we no longer have, but the church father Irenaeus mentions it by a Gnostic uh, Christian named Basilides. Basilides claimed, this is, seems to be where the Quran's getting it, that, or something like it. Basilides claims that Simon of Cyrene carried Jesus' cross to the place of crucifixion, and when, G when they got there, Jesus pulled an identity switch. He made Simon of Cyrene look like him, Jesus, and Jesus himself took on the appearance of Simon of Cyrene. So the Romans crucified the one they thought was Jesus, even though it was Simon of Cyrene, and Jesus stood by laughing. <laughs> he thought he pulled it. <laughs> Presumably Simon didn't think it was so funny because he's getting crucified mm -hmm. because Jesus is pulled. This. That's, so that's in this gospel. We don't have the gospel. It was the gospel of facilities. Some people used it. Um, so that, other than that, everybody agreed that Jesus got crucified. They had different understandings of how what it meant. But so this was not this is not like something that <laughs> it was like a widespread belief in early Christianity that he didn't get crucified. And it's it's kind of the the Muslim perspective now uh, seems to be drawn from that, but. Uh, the Quran doesn't explain exactly what happened. It just it just says that they thought they crucified him, but they didn't. It was made to appear to them that way. Uh, yeah. But but the common the the most the most common Muslim position on that has always been uh, substitution that uh, Allah substituted someone else miraculously disguised him and made him look like Jesus. Most Muslims today yeah. say Judas, and then this other person was crucified, but everyone thought that it was uh, Jesus. And the the weird thing about that is it would actually mean that. The reason you right now believe that Jesus died by crucifixion and the reason I believe that Jesus died by crucifixion is that Allah did a, such an amazing job tricking everyone that it became the standard position. And now and now we all believe yeah. it. Yeah, well, you know, that you get that you get that a lot, not just with crucifixion, but you have people say, you know, everybody believes this because the original teacher was X and it got changed early on. The early Christian so-called heretics argued this all the time, is that, you know, well, it got changed. Those apostles changed it, you know, but uh, but we have the truth now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, historians don't do it that way. Historians look for evidence. Yeah, and it, 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 I just find that interesting because if someone says this didn't happen, God, God actually did a miracle and made you think it happened, 
yeah. mean, that would explain the evidence. I mean, you know, if God yeah. said, hey, I, you, you think you're talking to, to Bart Ehrman right now, but you're not. I'm just making you think. Well, that I mean, that would account for the evidence. It's just kind of a weird well, I used, explanation. I used, that argument, I used that argument when I was a conservative evangelical, at least I had friends did, to explain why you have a fossil record. Hmm. Where are right. the dinosaurs? The devil put them in there. <laughs> you know, so like, okay, you don't believe the evidence. You make up some reason to explain the evidence. Uh, and so, yeah, so, it, you know, it isn't just Muslims doing this. Hmm. Um, yeah, and so it, th that goes back to a situation where, I mean, you can explain anything that, anything you don't want to agree with, you can explain in that yeah. fashion. Yeah, turn on the news sometime. Now, uh, just wanted to look at one uh, particular example uh, really quick of, of what we're talking about with these early sources, because I have the Arabic infancy gospel here and I have uh, I have the Quran. So just wanted to look, uh, look at one quick passage here. Um, but so we have the Quran and we have Allah comes to, uh, well, the angel Gabriel goes to Mary and tells her she's going to have a son and so on. And then uh, Jesus is born and then some Jews want to accuse her of, uh, you know, committing a sin because she's you know, she has a child, and then they come to her and say, "O oh, sister of Aaron, thy father was not a man of evil, nor thy mother a woman unchaste." But she pointed to the babe, so baby Jesus. They said, "How can we talk to one who was a child in the cradle?" He said, "I am indeed a servant of God. He hath given me revelation and made me a prophet." And why that's interesting, it, it looks like. Um, it really looks like the Arabic infancy gospel where Jesus is born, where Jesus is born. And then he, uh, he starts speaking and let me pull it up real quick. And we have Jesus saying in the Arabic infancy gospel, uh, he has said that Jesus spoke there in the middle of the page. He has said that Jesus spoke and indeed when he was lying in his cradle, and said to Mary his mother, I am Jesus, the Son of God, the Logos, whom thou hast brought forth, as the angel Gabriel announced thee, and my father has sent me for the salvation of the world. It actually looks like Muhammad isn't just drawing on these stories. It looks like he's just taking them and modifying them so that instead of Jesus saying, I'm the Son of God sent for the salvation of the world, he says, uh, I'm a servant of Allah, sent with uh with revelation and i'm a prophet yeah makes sense to me i mean it's clear you know if you've got stories that are like that prior to the quran and they're very similar to the quran then it's you know it's not an accident but it's it's like you know i mean going back to the earlier thing it's not an accident that you have these stories of other divine men in the greek and roman world before jesus who were mm -hmm. born miraculously do miracles and raise the dead and stuff I mean, it's not you know, it's not an accident that you have these similar stories. Um, what, what's interesting is that uh, right after that passage of Jesus speaking, even though it's not mentioned anywhere in the text that Jesus, uh, that, that there's anything about the Son of God in the passage in the Quran, immediately after the passage, it says, Allah does not have a son. He has no need. He just has to say be, and it isn't. So the question is, what he's re what is Allah responding to if there hasn't been any discussion of Jesus being the Son of God? But, that's good. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. That's a good piece of evidence. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Yeah. So listen. It shows, it shows, if people didn't pick up what you're saying, it shows that the story originally had him talking about being a son, mm -hmm. not a, not a servant. Right? Yeah. So yeah. it looks like Allah is actually responding to people asking him about this yeah, yeah. story yeah, or something no, like that. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. All right. One one more issue, and this is kind this is kind of uh, kind of weird. But I have a, a short video clip, and I just like your reaction, because when I react to it, they say I'm a Christian trying to uh, cover up the truth. But um, there are, I mean, th th there are people who try to line up with, uh, you know, scholarship and so like Shabir Ali is a, a Muslim, but, you know, he reads James Dunn and Raymond Brown and so on and, and tries to interact with that material. Um, but then there are others who, I don't know, it just seems like in the age of the Internet, you can say anything you want, no matter how far, uh, how far away from uh, anything remotely resembling scholarship. Now, I don't know, because you may watch this and, and say, oh, actually, yeah, here, I know what he's talking about. I can't figure out what he's talking about. But I'd like uh, your perspective on a clip from Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Uh, the clip is from a, a Catholic woman asks him a question about how he became a Muslim and so on. He starts interacting with her. But uh, then... Sheikh Yusuf Estes explains the origin of the Catholic Church. And I wanted to bring this up just because the clip has millions of views and there are people who take him uh, seriously on this. So 
Okay. Uh, ready to watch a video clip? All right. You might think I'm a Catholic, I'll never be anything but a Catholic. But I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to be honest. This is not for you to, you know, start a debate, but just be honest. Was Jesus a Catholic? And it's not open to debate, so there's no point in opening that up, because you know and I know he wasn't. The Catholic Church was in business about 300 years before Jesus was born. It's on their website. Don't go like this. It's on their website. That's where I took it from. The Catholic Church was really started in Rome by Alexander the Great. Do you know what the word Catholic means? It means universal. It was the universal church for the Roman Empire. If you didn't join it, you could not be a Roman citizen. And it was opposed to the teachings of Judaism and opposed to the teachings of the early Christians for more than 200 and some years. And they were diametrically opposed to each other to the extent that it was the Romans killing the early Christians. Now, if you understand that and you go to their website and read, they didn't even take over Christianity until the year 325 A.D. And when they did, they changed a lot of things. Again, referring to their own website. But if you want to check it in Brand Britannica or Americana or grow your encyclopedias, go ahead and read about the Catholic Church. All right. Well, I heard you laughing at, at that. So why are you laughing? <laughs> I mean, no, it's just completely ignorant. It's not just, it's like, he just doesn't know. He, he's like, that is the, one of the stupidest things I've heard in a long time, that Alexander the Great started the Roman Catholic Church in Rome? What? I mean, okay, just ask him to read a book about Alexander the Great sometime, how much how much time he spent in Rome. And how could the, what, what do you even think? What? I mean, it's like, no, I'm sorry. That's, that, uh. That's way down there in the realm of stupidity. It's just, you know, why do people do this in public? You know, at least, at least read something. And, you know, I mean, just, just virtually everything he says was wrong. Except, of course, Jesus was not a Catholic. No. <laughs> but, I mean, apart from that, everything he says is wrong. And not just, like, my opinion wrong. I mean, it's just wrong. <laughs> How funny. Okay, yeah, well, millions of people are watching that instead of uh, your show. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I have to say, I'm I'm glad you said that because I was a little nervous. You're going to say, oh, yeah, I know about a source that he's talking about and, and so on. Because, <laughs> he's making it up. Yeah. He it, missed the article. He read 300 and he thought it meant 300 B.C. <laughs> and somehow, but it's Alexander the Great, too. So it's. Yeah, well, that's about when Alexander was, so it must have been him. And, you know, he's hanging out in Rome, starting yeah, a church. It's Rome. That's what Alexander <laughs> did. We. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, yeah, well, 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 well. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's actually a good that's actually a good uh, lead into uh, us wrapping things up here because there are uh, tons of fans of Sheikh Yusuf Estes who would believe their guy because he's their guy. Uh, so they would believe their guy because he's their guy. And there are there are atheists who would, um, you know, listen to Richard Dawkins or your fans would listen to you. And there are Christians who would would go with with our guy. But uh, sometimes we can be wrong about things. And so we shouldn't just go along with what our guy says. We should we should want to verify that that, you know, what everyone is saying is correct. Yes. It's not about who says it. Whoever says it's got nothing to do with whether it's right or wrong. You've got you got to look at the evidence. Mm -hmm. and it's like, oh my God, no, I'm sorry. I mean, you cannot follow somebody who says crazy things just because you like you know the way he says things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. All right. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for uh, being here, Dr. Ehrman, and everyone. Uh, the point of me uh, wrapping up like that was. We have a debate. Uh, in case you weren't here at the beginning, we have a debate next month. Dr. Bart Ehrman versus Dr. Michael Lacona on whether the resurrection of Jesus actually happened. The link to that event is in the description box. As I mentioned before, uh, click that link. Go ahead and register for the event. 
and uh, hopefully a bunch of us can all watch it on that day and then the apostate prophet and i an atheist and a christian get together with all of you and watch it afterwards uh, so we can all hopefully learn about someone who as bart ehrman and mike lacona agree with is uh, the most important figure uh, in civilization and so dr ehrman thank you for joining us any any final thought before i uh, click off here i'll just say that people you know when people listen to a debate, they should do it with a fairly open mind. It's not they have to agree they're going to change their mind, but they, they need to be able to agree that, yeah, actually, that's a good argument. I have to think about that mm -hmm. rather than just writing everything off because they disagree, because otherwise there's no point watching it. Mm -hmm. You're just confirming your. And so uh, I think debaters, too, they have to listen to the other side and, and pay attention. And I hope you're, I hope the people in this debate do that because it's going to be it's going to be an important and interesting debate. All right. Well, uh, thank you and hope to see everyone there uh, next month uh, joining us watching it online. Catch you all then.